Hi everyone, um, as Matt said, I'm Brad, and I'll be leading you through month two of uh, the PHP and MySQL for Dynamic Websites by Larry Ullman. Um, um, if you haven't got the book, this is it. Um, and this is the second book that I've done of Larry's. I did the um, Effortless E-Commerce, and uh, that was a really good book as well. So, um, so today we're going to be covering chapters three, which is creating dynamic websites, chapter four, an introduction to MySQL, and chapter five, an introduction to SQL. So the first part of the book, um, Larry was cut, we created a basically a static web page, um, and we're going to be showing how we can break that out into reusable pieces by using include files, um, and then we're going to look into um, handling forms and uh, making them sticky, and then creating our own custom PHP functions. Uh, there's a couple ways that we can include uh, files with PHP. There's um, two. Basically, there's the include method and the require. Um, each one have a once option. Um, with an include or require, you can include the same file multiple times. With once, it will only uh, include the file once. So if you've got, especially once you get a more um, detailed website, you might be having multiple includes that are including the same files. And using the include once, require once will just make sure that those files are only loaded once into memory. Um, and then we've got some other, I've got some examples here. Uh, so the basic page looks like this. Um, everything is in one file. And with include, we can break that out by creating um, separate header files. With me. And so from here, we basically took everything from the content div um, and grabbed all of that and put it into the header. And we did the same with the footer, um, just having that footer there with the copyright. Since the, the top of the page um, and the bottom of the page we're going to use on every page, it made sense to break those out. Uh, as I said, there's multiple ways we can use include, um, and just to show what that can do by including it multiple times. Uh, you can see here the header is actually being repeated. And if we do the same thing with the include once, we'll actually only see that uh, show up on, on one page, uh, only once in there. So even though that file has it on the PHP side, on the back end, the server's knowing to not include that header more than one time. So it's just showing it once. Uh, the difference between um, include and require is um, if the file, if it can't find the file that you're using to include, um, it will continue processing the page. Whereas require, it will actually stop processing the page. Um, and that's useful for things like uh, if you're going to include uh, connection strings to your database, you want to make sure that's there um, before continuing on the page. So if that's missing, it will actually break the page. And I do have an example um, with this require. So here the page is working just fine. The footer is being included there. And if I lose that, The footer is not there because it couldn't find it. Um, with um, include, we won't get any error messages, but with the uh, require, we will actually see error messages, or we should see error messages show up in our log files. Right here we can see fatal error. The required uh, footer.htm uh, wasn't, wasn't found. Uh, 
Uh, let's get back to this. Uh, we also have the options of when you include the file, you can use relative paths, uh, which is based on the, where the PHP script is. So in the example there, it's looking for the header.php in the same folder that the script is running from. Or you can use absolute paths, uh, which is related to the file system. I personally tend to use the uh, absolute path because when you're developing on one machine, um, you, your server that you're going to end up deploying to might have a slightly different structure that you need to follow. So by having the um, having a relative path always to that file, uh, if that file gets moved, well, if you move the um, script that's calling it, it will always find that included file. Um, and there are various PHP functions that you can use to actually help you with that, um, that will actually find the file path of your script or where your website is and help you build that out. So when you're deploying out to your website, you won't necessarily know what your home um, folder is going to be located. So that will actually help you with that. So it's kind of a hybrid between uh, relative and absolute, but giving you that absolute positioning to that file. Um, and then with um, the main thing with this chapter was handling forms. Um, in the first and the second chapter, uh, Larry built the forms to have the HTML in one file, and then that was submitting to a second file. Um, now we're going to be using the same file to process the submitted data from the form and display the form as well. So in order to do that, we need to have a conditional check to see if the form has, po has been posted to us. And we use the uh, server method, uh, request method, and we're looking for a post. Uh, the first time you go to the page is always going to be a get, uh, but when you're submitting a form, you want to be using post, and then the server side will understand that the form is being posted to us, being submitted, and will uh, go ahead and process that for us. So what does that look like? Clean some of these up. So, so what happens is <clears throat> we have the form down on the bottom here. And I took some liberty with the uh, gas prices. I figured since we're enjoying some lower fuel costs right now, I'll show that uh, compared to the book. Uh, when we set up our form, we have to give it the action and the method that we're using. So with that, uh, when I go ahead and hit submit with this, it's going to post back to the same page. And when the uh, PHP parser starts running through the script again, it's going to run to this conditional. And it's going to say, if this form, if this page is being posted to me rather than uh, a GET request, let's go ahead and start searching. Let's go ahead and start processing the data that's being sent back in the, uh, the post to us. Um, do you want, I can go into more detail on what's actually being done here if you have any questions on that. Um, so what that looks like on the web page. So we have our form. We can put in our commute, what our cost of our fuel is, how good our car's economy, and that runs through with the post and gives us our output that we have um, right here being posted out to the screen. What we'll see is, even though I just submitted that, I no longer see the values that I entered in. So in order to save those values, we use what are called sticky forms, or what uh, Larry's terming as sticky forms. And that then, uh, we add conditionals to each of the input fields so that we can um, see if a value's been posted or if there's a value available for us to display for those. Uh, and in order to do that, for each different uh, input that we have, um, there's a slightly different way of displaying uh, data that we want to show back to the, uh, to the user. For a text field, it's the, the value um, attribute. 
in a text area, it actually goes between the, uh, the attributes. Uh, a radio button uh, or checkboxes, we use the checked equals checked. Um, for select and drop downs, we use select uh, equals selected. Um, so dynamically, what that would look like is we'd have to echo out that value um, in, into the HTML. And I have that prepared as well for us. So can everyone see the code? Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. So with our distance form, we have our uh, text input. And then here within the value field, we're saying if we have a posted value for distance, let's echo that back out to the, uh, to the, disp to the, uh, the web page. Um, and we're using an is set uh, PHP function, which is basically saying if this value or this variable is, exists and is not null, we're going to go ahead and process um, the echo statement. For the radio buttons, uh, we have the same, same code. Uh, we have the same beginning of the input with our type of radio, our name, our value. And then in order to determine if we want to show that one is checked, we have our conditional of checking if the uh, radio button um, has been posted, and then if that value is equal to the value of this radio button. And then we're going to show checked. What we'll see is it's actually quite a lot of code for each one. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to slim that down and uh, make it a little bit easier for us uh, and get some, uh, some of the PHP working for us here. And the same thing is true for the select uh, drop downs. We have each of our options, and we need to, again, go ahead and do a, a conditional to check if that uh, element has been submitted and what the value is so that we can go ahead and um, say that it's uh, selected. So, yes? Can we pause just for a moment? Sure. People are hungry. Absolutely. <laughs> I do see people going, so we'll hold there for a second. Thank you. No. What is it? Because I can't place it. It sounds north. It sounds, you know, but it isn't Scottish. Yeah, no, oh, if it was Scottish, I'd be in the kilt. They, they, well, and they massacred, the, you know, all of them. But, uh, Keep guessing. You're close. Well, Welsh? No. Because they have a little thing. Yeah. Thing. Um, and it's not South African. No. Because that, that, that sounds sort of somewhere between English and Australian. You know? I, I mean, unless they're Afrikaners. A little, bit of, a little bit of German in it, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, English. English? Yeah. What part of England? Uh, the Cotswolds. No shit. Wow. I, yeah, interesting. Interesting. Now, there's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of something that sounds north, you know, a little lilt or... I guess they'll be editing this, but, um, yeah, no, from the Cotswolds, um, yeah. which is just a hundred miles north uh, west of London. Yeah, near Stratford upon Avon, and south of, of the Lake District. Yeah, yeah, but it's beautiful. Yeah, God, I, I drove through there, and those cottages, the stone cottages, are fantastic. And beautiful countryside. Oh, it is absolutely. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I do miss it, but I've been here since '97. Really? Really? Wow! Wow! Yeah. Hey, my family's from the states. Um, no just my uh, kid needs to hear us. So I wonder if you have a slighter accent than because of that. Oh, it's tough to say because where I'm from, the yeah. accent isn't super thick. It's not like a Cockney accent. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. like a Scottish accent. Or a Yorkshire accent. Or a Yorkshire accent. Yeah, it's more of a yeah, yeah mellow I mean, accent. I can understand it. You know, it's funny because like you go to York. And people are wonderful. You know, you open a map up and you've got five people wanting to help you. Um, but you can't understand what the hell they're saying. You know? I mean, you, yeah. you have to take a moment to translate, at least I do. Right. Um, but uh, that's interesting. Uh, now, is, 
well, the whole Midlands, the whole industrial stuff is to your south. Uh, north. North. Okay. Yeah, I'm just south of Birmingham. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you get into Birmingham and Worcester County and mm -hmm. that Kidderminster, and yeah. that's all to your north. Yeah. Yeah, Wolverhampton. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to, yeah, I can think of a map, I suppose, but if you think of, if you know where Wales is? Yes. Right? So kind of, where, England's a witch riding a pig. Have you ever heard that? Y yeah, no. Okay, go look at a map of England. Yeah. And go, oh yeah, it's a witch riding a pig. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Scotland, the Outer Hebrides is the hat. Yeah. Uh, the lower Scotland is the, the, the witch's nose. Yeah. Wales is the pig's head. Yeah. London's in the hind quarters with the leg kicking yeah. out. Uh, and Devon and Cornwall, the, the front leg. So yeah, right where yeah. that front leg comes up to the head to where Wales is, Cotswolds is kind of just east of there. And, and I think in Kent and stuff, you wouldn't hear much accent, right? An American would yeah. hear too. It would be mild. Mm. Now I gather in Devon, it, it's thick. It, it's broader and thicker yeah. and a little bit slow. And, yeah. You know, country. It's amazing for such a small country <laughs> how broad the. Uh, I've heard Accents you can go from uh, one some, valley to the next. And totally and, different. And actually have, have yeah. differences. It's getting less true now. Yeah. 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 I say in the last 30 years or so, people have traveled more. Yeah. And are moving more. But, right. yeah, it's definitely the case where you can, you know, some people have never left their area. Well, it's funny, you know, some of the New Englanders, uh, uh, looking at this, actually, New Englanders, uh, that came over in the Great Migration, uh, 1620, 1640 or so, are uh, about 20,000 people, and then no one came for a long time. So they all married each other. But, but they had also come from certain parts of England where they'd been marrying each other for right. 5,000 years. You know, yeah, because they, they didn't move. They didn't move. They and couldn't. They yeah. didn't move largely when they came here. Um, so, but anyway, fascinating. I, I'd never heard that accent before. Yeah, well, it's, it's a tough one because I grew up with American yeah. parents. Yeah. I've been here for so long. Yeah, yeah. I go back once a year, and it, my accent gets a little stronger when I'm there. But then, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's getting to that point where it's getting diluted. You know, it's a, usually it's a South, and it, it, it wasn't South African. It, it, English South African yeah. folks have an interesting accent that isn't quite English and it's not quite Australian, you know, it's right. it's, it's sort of own animal, but uh, but I was hearing some some stuff that sounded like the kind of thing that works its way into Ireland, you know, and, and I imagine in Ireland the accent shift, oh, yeah. depending on where you are. Definitely, yeah. You know. It's, ama it's, it's, it's amazing how... Fast, well, beautiful place. I, 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 I would love... My idea of a wonderful way to spend a couple of summers would be walking on those, those yeah. footpaths around and just exploring. Yeah. Uh, just beautiful country. It is. And great yeah. people. Um, so do your parents live here now? My mother lives there, and my father moved back to the States and lives in Florida. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Florida's not so bad either, I guess. It's, it's not too bad. It's a long way from the Cosmos. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> hey, you should grab some. Is that? Start yeah, I'll give uh, we'll one more minute. You guys comfortable starting again, eating through the presentation? Okay. okay. Seems, seems a little dry, but that's me. How's he doing so far? You doing all right? Pretty good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, if you have any questions, do raise your hand. Um, and if I'm going too quickly or too slowly, let me know. Um, so where we'll pick up, we're just um, looking at the sticky forms. As we could see from the last example, 
my uh, results, well, the data I entered wasn't kept. Um, and it is nice to be able to reshow the same data to someone, especially if they've you know, entered in a field incorrectly. You don't want them to have to start the whole form again. So we were looking at the code for that um, by using conditionals, looking for the posted values, and then echoing those out when they're there. So what the sticky form looks like to us when we actually enter it in is uh, we will get the option to make modifications to it. And obviously I filled that form out correctly. If I had missed out a field or had uh, entered it in incorrectly, you know, I'm getting an error message. All I have to do is correct the one field and uh, everything's good to go again. So then, um, what have we looked at? So that was sticky forms. And then, uh, you know, the great thing about programming is that you can create functions to reuse your code um, and to make things easier to read. And uh, we're going to do that when we were looking at the code a few minutes ago. You know, we're seeing with the radio buttons that there's an awful lot of code here that we need to to write out, and here we're doing it three times, and then five times here um, with the drop down. So what we can do is break this out into a function, and uh, this is what Larry does uh, in the book next. Uh, we're creating a, a basically a function to help us create these radio buttons. We're passing in the value that we want the radio button to represent, um, and then just using the, the code that we're familiar with, with echoing out HTML, um, putting together the radio button, and then automating that check. Um, so that if the value that we passed in um, is also the value that's been posted back to the form, we can go ahead and check that. And that makes the form a lot easier to write. Uh, here we are with the price per gallon radio buttons and we've taken all that other code and created the function, reusing it three times uh, when we only had to write it once. Um, so that gives us this form. And if we happen to feel like looking at the code, it really doesn't look that much different from what we started off with at the very beginning with the static page. Um, yeah. It's seamless that the header and the footer are being integrated for us. And then here's the inputs um, written out all in one line here. But that's the HTML for us, and we have to, didn't have to write as much PHP code. Uh, you can, when you're creating your functions, um, you can really give them any name that you like, um, as long as it starts with a letter and an underscore. Um, and that you don't use a reserved word in PHP. So you can't use an existing function of PHP. Um, you, can't really, you can't override their functions. Uh, you would just get an error if you created your own function for is set. You need to call it something else. Maybe underscore is set. Um, and same with echo, is numeric, uh, any of those PHP functions. Uh, the other great thing about functions, and we saw with this first one that we've written, you can pass in parameters. Um, and that allows the function then to work with data that you're, you're giving it. Um, so again, with our function here, we're passing in the value that we want it to um, assign to that radio button. And that's a parameter that we're giving it. Uh, and you can give it as many parameters as you like. There's no real limit. Um, I think there is a limit, it's probably like 64 or something, but you can give it um, as many as you like, as many as you need. Um, you can also pass in any kind of data element. You can pass in a number, a string, an array, an object. Um, there's no limit to what you can pass in. Uh, let's see. Again, the parameter names are, um, we'll get into scope in a second, but 
the name of the parameter that you specify here is irrelevant to the rest of the script, script around it. Um, the parameters that you, you specify at uh, the function are only available within the function. Um, nothing outside that function could also, can access this, uh, this variable um, value. Uh, the, if you create variables outside of the function, um, that's for include, sorry. Um, so anything created outside the function is not available within the function except for um, superglobals. And uh, the post is, is an example of a superglobal. Um, but you don't want to rely too much on uh, superglobals in your functions because then you're kind of tying yourself too much to the context of the script. Um, you want to make your functions as um, portable as possible so you can reuse them uh, wherever you can. Uh, you can also specify default values um, when you're creating a function. So if we wanted to, say, give this a value of 10, um, so when you call that function now, you can just call create uh, gallon radio, not specify uh, a value to give it, and it will automatically give it the 10. Um, so that's a nice way, especially if you're creating a function with a lot of inputs, a lot of parameters, it's a nice way to allow someone or allow yourself to call that function, not have to specify all of those parameters every time. Uh, the other great thing you can do with functions is return a value from it. Um, and it, that's great because you can create a function, maybe it does a calculation, and that's what we're going to do in a minute. Um, so you can send it in the values you want it to work on and then get back your result. Um, and the way you do that is by using the return uh, word, and you just return whatever it is. And again, just like a parameter going in, you can return any kind of object out, an object, uh, an array, a string, a number. Uh, and to then consume that uh, value when you're coming, coming out of the function, you're just going to assign it to a new variable. And uh, we get to do that with the, uh, which one is it? We create the calculate uh, the trip cost where we're inputting in the miles, the MPG, and the price per gallon, doing the calculation. And then right here, we're returning out the, uh, the amount in dollars formatted here using the PHP function format, number format, uh, with two decimal places. And to call that, here we are, we're just using, setting it to the variable of cost. We're calling the function and passing in our four, our three parameters um, that we're getting out from the returned uh, posted uh, form. Uh, so I touched on variable scope a few minutes ago. Um, basically, every variable in any of your scripts has a scope. Um, any variable be defined before an include file is also available in that include file. And we're using an example of that um, at the, in each of these um, includes with the header. We're setting the page title before the header is being included. And now we can use that page title variable within the include file. And we're using that to uh, specify the page title in the HTML. Uh, any variables defined in a function, um, whether as a parameter going in or as a variable within the function, is only available for use by that function. Um, everything outside of that function doesn't know that it exists. Variables defined outside of functions are also not available inside a function, uh, with the one exception to superglobals, um, which, as I said, the uh, post... Um, is a, is a super global along with get and many others. Um, but you don't want to rely, uh, it's a good practice not to rely on those within your functions, as I said earlier. This way, your function can be more um, dynamic and uh, portable to, to your code. So that covers the um, dynamic part of the forms, uh, of, of the, the book so far. Does anyone have any questions? So um, 
in order to make a truly dynamic site, we need a place to store the data, and, we use, and we're using MySQL for that. Um, and what is MySQL? Well, it's a relational, re relational database management system, um, and that basically is a, it's a collection of files stored on the file system that uh, store all our data in, um, in tables. Basically, there's a, a file per table, um, and that then contains all the columns that we need and then all the data in there. Um, and in order to access the data within those tables, we use what's called uh, structured query language or SQL. Uh, when you're naming your database elements, whether it's your database or your table, or even customized functions or store procedures, uh, you should only contain uh, certain letters uh, should only contain letters, numbers, and the underscore. Uh, you shouldn't be using special characters. They won't be recognized. Um, you should not use the names that are also used by um, MySQL for its uh, keywords. Um, there is exceptions to that and ways of getting around that, but you really want to try and avoid using um, their keywords. Uh, you should treat everything um, in SQL, especially in MySQL, as case sensitive. Um, because since it relies on the file system to store the data, if, you're, um, if your file system is case sensitive, your SQL also needs to be case sensitive. Um, so on Windows, that's not so much of a problem, but if you're using Macs can be an issue, and especially uh, Unix or Linux, which most of the hosting is using, um, you want to kind of stick to that uh, case sensitive uh, rule. Uh, your name shouldn't be longer than 64 characters, and they must be unique within the realm. Now, the realm is uh, the database. It's the tables. Um, so your databases need to be have a unique name on the server that they reside and on uh, hosting. Um, the host usually takes care of that by appending either your username or your domain name to the database. So it would be, you know, Google underscore my, t my database or whatever you want to call it. Uh, with, in the database, you can't have, you know, all your tables need to be uniquely named as well. And then within the tables, your columns need to be uniquely named. You can use the same column names in multiple tables um, because they're isolated within that other table. And we're gonna, we're gonna use that a lot. Um, you know, most tables are gonna have an ID column that's going to be com common with all those with all the tables that you have. Um, for storing your data, um, you know, each column needs to have a, a data type assigned to it. Um, the typical ones are you know, string, which could be represented as text, um, char or varchar, numeric or date time. Um, char and varchar are essentially the same with the one exception that if you specify, when you specify your columns, you also need to give it a size. So you're gonna store a username. You might want that to be a maximum of 20 characters. So with char, you would specify 20 characters. Varchar, you'd also specify the maximum size is 20 characters. When you go to store data in there, if the username only happens to be 10 characters, with char, it's gonna pad 10 add 10 spaces to pad the space. Um, and then when you take out of that column, you're also gonna need to then trim the data that's coming out. With varchar, it's just gonna store those 10 characters and only take up the space of 10 characters. Um, and on chapter four on page 115, um, there's a great comprehensive list of all the available types and, uh, descri and description for each one. When you're creating your table, so you know, the example that we are actually is in the next, the next chapter in chapter five, I've pulled forward here. Um, we're gonna create a user table. And once you know, we go through the identifying the columns that you need, um, we're having a username and that's gonna be a number field. Uh, first name, last name, email and password, all is text with various um, sizes. Um, and then a registration date as date time. The, you could store everything 
in your database is text if you wanted to, but by doing that, you lose out on a lot of features of, of the database engine, um, and that's storing the data, that's retrieving the data. You can um, do, if you're storing a date, if you store it as a string, you will only ever be, ever, ever be able to return that string. Whereas if you store it as a date time field, you can pull out just the year, just the day. You can have, um, you can pull out the day of the week that it was um, saved in that field. Um, you have a lot more flexibility as what you use with it, what you can do with it. Uh, there's also other column properties and um, those are specifying a default value. Uh, in the example of the user ID, we actually set a default value. We actually make it an auto increment field, which means that you don't have to specify a value. It will always give you the next available number uh, in sequence. You can specify if a field, a column is null or not null. Um, a null field means you can store nothing in it. Uh, not null means that you need to give it a value, otherwise it won't store a record for that row. Uh, auto increment, um, you can have one auto increment uh, column per table, and it's typically used for an ID to give it a unique uh, reference in each, in each row, and that brings us to the primary key. You want, every table needs to have a primary key. It can be made up of one or more, co more columns. Um, typically, uh, in smaller databases, you'll just be using like an ID, uh, an order incremented ID on there. And the, the purpose is you always need to have a unique way of referencing every single row in the database. And uh, when we start selecting data uh, a little later on, we're going to see how that, that comes in. Uh, and then to access MySQL, there's two primary ways. One is through the uh, command line, uh, the MySQL client that's installed pretty much on every machine that has MySQL. And the other is a graphical web interface, uh, PHP My Admin. And that's the way that 99% of the time you're probably going to interact with MySQL outside of your code. Uh, and especially if you're using a hosted uh, server, that's going to be the only way that probably going to let you uh, access it unless you have um, a big, uh, a dedicated server uh, with them. So what the command line looks like is, let's see, I should be able to get in. You'd specify MySQL um, and then the username you're using, in this case I'm using root and the password um, and leaving it blank will prompt you for it. And So here, you know, just quickly just showing you what databases are available on, on my machine here. And we can do the same thing with um, PHP my admin. And again, we have all the databases listed and we can select one and then see all the tables that we have. So this is a much nicer way to interact with it. Um, there are certain things that you that I tend to use the command line for, which is uh, backing up and restoring databases. I just find it a little bit easier. Um, with the uh, web interface, you're limited to the size when you're importing um, your database. You're limited to uh, the size of file that you can actually upload. And when you're working with a large database, uh, you just end up having to work at the command line for that. So, that takes care of MySQL. And once you have your database, um, well, first we need to create one. And then we're going to go through how to actually uh, interact with that with a couple of examples. So to create a database, um, you can do it graphically through PHP MyAdmin. Um, but essentially what that's doing is exactly what we have here. We have uh, to create your database. Um, the syntax is as simple as create database, uh, which is, and then the database name. And we'll run through this. And then now if we look at our databases, we'll see that site name database has been created for us. 
In order to start interacting with that, we need to use the use command and terminate all our lines with semicolons. So if you're a fan, not a fan of semicolons, you might want to use the uh, web interface. Um, but what that actually allows us to do is we can, um, I'll do an example in a little bit, but you can put your scripts across multiple lines. And uh, we actually see that right here when we go ahead and create our user uh, table. We've got it all on one line, all, all on multiple lines, and then our semicolon at the end is telling the uh, MySQL engine, go ahead and run everything that I've entered so far. So to create our table, just paste that in and run it. Um, and then we can show our tables that are within our um, database of site user. So now that we have a database and a table, we want to go ahead and start inserting some data into it. There's two ways, two uh, variations on inserting the data. You can, uh, the first one is by naming the columns that you want to insert the data into. Uh, if we go back out, we'll see that we have a user ID, a first name, a last name, email, password, and registration. Here we're just inputting the first name, the last name, the email, the password, and registration date. And by doing so, we're leaving out the user ID. We're actually going to, MySQL is going to go ahead and add that for us. And we can see that that row has been entered in for us with a user ID of, of one. The other way is to go ahead and insert into every uh, column that's in the table. You don't need to specify the column names. Um, so here it's going to insert into users and then the values. Um, we're specifying null as the uh, user ID. So this way the default value will get selected for us. In this case, it's an order incrementing number, so we'll get, in this case, we'll get number two. Um, and if we go ahead and select that again, now we see that our username, our, our user Zoe, has the ID of two. I'm going to go ahead and just insert a bunch more, just so that we have some data to work with with some of the other uh, queries that we're going to be running. Uh, and then one final thing I do want to mention is the uh, single quote in SQL is very important. It's used to uh, delineate um, your data that you're putting in. And there are cases where the data you're going to have, the data you're going to be wanting to insert has single quotes in as well. So the example I have here is uh, uh, O'Brien. So in order to add that in successfully, you actually have to use an escape sequence, which is the backslash. Um, so the, the MySQL parser says, okay, the next character after this backslash, I need to just treat as a character, not as part of um, the, the, the query. So I'll go ahead and drop that in. And if we go ahead and select we'll see that the actual text looks just as we'd expect it. First name. So we can see that the backslash doesn't actually get added to our data there. Um, so once you have your data, you're going to want to be able to retrieve it. And by to, in order to retrieve it, we use the select command. Um, and there's, again, you can select various ways. Um, the, 
The first way is with the star, and that just selects all the rows, all the columns. Um, so, let's see what that looks like. So you can see we're getting all our data there. Um, you can specify the columns that you want to show or retrieve. So here we're just going to pull back the uh, first name and last name. And it makes it a little bit more manageable, especially in this uh, command line interface to see everything. Um, and it gives you the column names at the top. And that's how we, in your PHP code, you'd actually reference the data by the column name. You don't have to select uh, columns from, from a table. You can also use functions. Um, and this one here is using the now function, which retrieves uh, the current time on the server. Um, you can also do other uh, functions, like convert everything to uppercase. So we put in lowercase, don't panic. and comes out as uppercase. Um, and the great thing about the PHP, uh, the, the MySQL functions, is you can chain these together and use them in your select queries. You can use various, you could use the uh, two upper on a last name column, but you don't need to use it on the first name if you didn't want to. Um, you can also select um, with uh, conditionals. So, you know, so far we've been getting back all the rows. Well, you might only need one row out of the database, or you might just be looking for um, all the user, all your users with the last name of Simpson. So that just narrows it down. That's looking at all the last names and only returning the ones that have the criteria that we're looking for. Uh, the query is. Um, the text that you're searching for is actually case insensitive. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's, you know, you mix the case or you're not sure what the case is, um, you can bring it all back. You can also, with your where clause, specify, you know, I want to find something where, you know, a value isn't there. So it's null or if it's blank. Um, and then also, you know, here we're using the sh1 uh, function to um, run a hash on my pass. And you can use that in your where clause as well. We were using it on the uh, insert to hash the passwords going into the database. Uh, you can also use it then uh, in, the, in the where clause to find everyone who has the same password. Um, I personally, I wouldn't use sh1 for password hashing. Um, it's a good example and it gets you in the right, right uh, the right idea, you don't want to be storing passwords as plain text, um, but you want to be using something like the, the PH, PHP has a great uh, built-in uh, password management API, um, password underscore hash, I think it's called, and uh, I'd recommend uh, reading up on that. Um, and then, you know, you can use other, um, other uh, features, other, other uh, criteria. Um, here, you can specify if you want. Uh, these three queries are doing all the same thing. We're basically looking for all the uh, users that their ID is not between 10 and 20. So it would return uh, 1 to 9 and 20 and up. And uh, I'll quickly run these. Um, because as I said, they're, they're all doing the same, same thing. And we can see in the results that 10 to 20 are missing. Uh, you can use the um, less than or uh, greater than um, logic. And you can also use the, the uh, SQL word uh, between, where you specify the lower limit and the upper limit. And by putting not in between, it's doing the reverse. So it's going to make sure it doesn't return those numbers uh, between 10 and 20. Um, you also have the ability to do a like comparison, and this is kind of this is where uh, this is how searches tend to work. Um, you can put in a partial word uh, that you're looking to find, and using the percentage uh, wildcard, it will match one, zero, or more characters after that. So it will look for everything that begins with S I M P, and then return everything that 
uh, it finds with those four initial characters. Um, and you can, you, you can specify that before, at the beginning, at the end, or at both um, in order to find those. So we found all the Simpsons uh, characters there. Uh, as well as the percentage which matches one, uh, zero or more characters, you can use an underscore and that will just match one character. So if you want to match exactly one, you could use one underscore exactly two, you use, uh, use two and so on. Uh, with, you can also sort your results. Um, there's only two options really. The default is ascending. Um, and you can go uh, descending as well. You can uh, sort, as we see here, uh, on multiple columns. So this example will, will sort by all those last names alphabetically. And then within the last names, it will sort the first names alphabetically as well. So we can see the Simpsons, and we start off with the A's and then continue on B, H, etc. Um, once you're dealing with large data sets, you're going to want to be able to limit the number of results that you get back. And uh, MySQL has a wonderful keyword of limit just for that purpose. Um, this first um, by limit takes up to two parameters. The first parameter is the number of r rows you want to uh, return. So here we're going to return the first um, five rows that we find in the database. And then you can also specify an offset. So retrieve five, five uh, records, but starting uh, three records in. So, so we can see this first query I did selected the very first five out of the database. And now we're starting off on that uh, on the fourth record, uh, Michael uh, Chabon. So inevitably, you've, you've inserted your data, you've selected it, you might have displayed it to your users. Um, you're going to want to update data from time to time as well. And in order to do that, you just use the update command. Um, this takes the uh, table that you want to update, and then the set command, which columns you want to modify. And you can modify, in this example, just using one, you can modify all the, the columns. Um, but you do need to specify each column name that you're going to update. So, so here I'm just pulling back the uh, email from Michael, and it's Michael at authors, and we're going to go ahead and update that to just be Mike. And if we select that back again, now we see that his new uh, email is there. Uh, you can also delete records, um, and uh, the syntax is, is, is very similar. Uh, instead of using update, you specify delete. Um, you have to also use the from uh, keyword here uh, to tell it which table we're going to delete from. Uh, with update and delete, if you just use um, update, um, in this example, if we didn't use the where clause, it would update every single email address in the database. And same with delete. If we just said delete from users, it would delete all the records in the database. So you want to be careful. Uh, always make sure you specify a where clause. And it's always it's a good idea if you know exactly how many records you're going to be deleting or updating to uh, go ahead and put a limit on there as well. Just in case you get your query wrong, you want to make sure that you minimize the uh, the damage that you do. Uh, if you're looking to clear a table, um, you can use the delete, um, but the, it is actually uh, wiser to use um, the truncate command, and that just makes things, uh, that just does it a little bit more efficiently and cleaner, um, doesn't uh, uh, fill your transaction logs uh, in the database. Um, you can also, so, Truncate is a great way to 
clear out a table. If you want to remove a table, you use a, the drop command. And if you want to remove a database, you'd also use a drop database. And then finally, uh, with MySQL, there are a lot of built-in functions that we can use on the data. Um, and PHP has a lot of the similar functions, but if you can do it at the database, it actually is a little bit more efficient um, than retrieving everything and passing it up to your script and then having your script run through. So, <clears throat> so you can do everything from concatenating strings. Um, here, we're going to put together into one field um, the username, the first name and last name, and give it an alias of um, full name. An alias is just a way of you naming, renaming a column on the fly or renaming data that you uh, generate from the database. So here we've got uh, a new column called full name. And this doesn't exist anywhere other than um, in the record set that we just returned. We haven't modified or touched the data in any way. Uh, you can also use, um, you know, check to see how long is a field, how many characters are being stored in, in, a, in a record. Um, if you need a, you can use you know, functions for generating random numbers. Um, you can use uh, the concatenate function with other functions to generate, in this case we're actually going to generate a, a, a money or a, a data looking like money. Oops. Um, so there's no end to what you can actually do. I mean, you can use, you know, you can keep embedding functions within functions and using that data if you really um, needed to. And um, early on, I mentioned about storing data correctly, and I mentioned doing uh, storing date times as a date time. Um, I've got some examples of um, why that's a good idea. So here we're just selecting um, the date portion of the date time. Um, it was storing it with the time as well. We're just retrieving the date. If you want to get the day name, there's functions for that using the day name function. So we created that data today, so it's Wednesday. Uh, you can also add um, dates. Um, so you can specify, say, you know, I want to find all the dates that are, or all the registrations that happened three days ago, or, um, you know, I want to give everyone that registered today, uh, you know, a free pass to something, and I can specify when that would expire. Um, so that's pretty much uh, SQL. Um, it's a very powerful language. Um, yeah, there's a lot to it, but this is just gives you enough to, uh, get going. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Right, so the question was, um, when you're connecting the front end to your database, um, would you escape the uh, single quote um, at the front end? Uh, and yes, uh, you would. I, you know, see, uh, PHP has um, lots of functions for that. Um, and depending on you know, what you're doing, uh, I would use one of those. Uh, this way, you, you take care of it at the front end. To make it, uh, is there a command to make a duplicate of a database of the entire database? That's a good question. I'm not sure if there's a command, um, but if I needed to do that, um, I would create a backup of the database and then restore it to a new database. So, you know, I'd go ahead and uh, create my new database and then um, restore that backed up database to that. Any other questions? I, 
can smell pizza, so I think I'm gonna have to go and grab some. <laughs> well, I hope you found this useful. Um, I certainly kind of enjoyed myself a little bit. It was, uh, I don't usually get out and, and, and speak, so this is uh, an experience for me that I'm uh, happy to have done. Thank you.